GR stands for genetic regeneration. Back in like, uh, I think it was 1996, uh, when I was in high school uh, down in California, in San Marcos, California. And uh, I was living with my dad at the time, and I had just got this new little camera, and it was a black and white little camera. And all you could do is shoot on it with, you know, the only way you could videotape a movie is by um, connecting it to a VCR and there was no re onboard recording device to record with so this little black and white camera that also didn't have a zoom didn't zoom on the lens at all or anything it just was like this little security camera and the only time if you wanted a close-up shot you'd have to move the camera in uh, close to the actor or then pull out if you wanted a wide shot or to for it to zoom out slowly you'd have to do it all by hand so, um, and you'd have to lug around a portable monitor, which would be like a, my big black, white, old black, white, clunky TV and a, a VCR that I've sa I saved up for. Anyways, hey, I got an idea. I'm going to redo that one movie because I thought that's fun. I made all these other movies. I want to do this fun sci-fi, you know, science fiction movie again. And uh, just for fun, you know, do a low budget, no budget B movie. And we'll do GR again. I'll do it. I'll get some people I know um, that I've met, and and uh, and I'll make the movie. So all of a sudden, here with no money in my pocket, like I always do, and with the help of my friends, and uh, I made a movie, GR again. And so here we're in uh, a couple years later, and I'm doing GR again. Just imagine what that can do for human genetics. People lose their entire limbs. Now you can grow them back, your own. No more grafting, no more scar tissue. Um, on the, this movie, we had um, Matt Schritz, AKA Matthew Von Decker. Really good, he worked with me also on Catastrophic Denouement. Um, very good actor. I mean, he's, he's playing the basically the Sort of, it's kind of like the lead role, even though we have an ensemble cast. And he really did a good job of reflecting um, what was written on the script and what um, ideas I had. And he also threw in ideas, and it, it was really, really awesome. Had a fun time, it was great, and he was, did a good job. I think my favorite thing was uh, before we even started making the movie, uh, Christian uh, came up to me and uh, and he wanted me to play the character Bias and uh, he wanted me to wear this wig, this black wig, and uh, I'm like, no, that's not gonna do it. I don't even look Italian, okay? I didn't. I saw this old movie, the the old GR with the you know the Italian mobster guy or whatever, 
uh, I was like thinking the hitman. I'm I'm definitely not that. So I went and went home that night and I shaved my head, and I ended up uh, coming in. I scared everyone on the set. I remember that. Uh, they turned around like, "Whoa, Dan, is that you?" <laughs> so I go, "Yes." <laughs> and that's what what became that's what became uh, my character Bice. And so that's. really good and he did a good job even Dan's mom came to the premiere of GR and she really thought he did a great job and that just seeing Dan's mom even think that that was awesome and so uh, and she walks into the theater and sits down and and uh, she comes back out early I was like on you didn't like the movie I thought yeah, for sure if anyone my mom would like it you know this is like going Great job! I'm going to talk to the director. I'm going to talk to Christian right now. You did a great job. People kept coming up like kind of curiously, like, kind of going, "No, it can't be." Hey, are you? I was like, "Going, huh? Are you that guy in that movie? Which one? The the bad guy?" I was like, "Yeah, I am." I was like, oh, "That's him!" And they kept coming out. I signed a few autographs. It was, it was great. Well, then there's uh, James Maxwell, and James Maxwell, I kind of met him through uh, Gus Larson. And, uh, well, James, he plays the character Gideon. He was a lifesaver. I mean, he, he plays this part, you know, he acts. And then also, on top of that, he uh, choreographs um, the fight scene, the main huge fight scene w between him and Bice. Yeah, James, he, uh, he, he was studying martial arts. I, I knew, I basically grew up learning a little martial arts, but, um, he, we were two different styles, so we had to work out something that was simple, something that we both could do, and then try to make it pull across on film. So I remember the the scene where where we're fighting in the church, and uh, and he says, "Why don't you th pick me up by my throat? And I'll hang on your hands." And we worked out a way to we rigged up like a table, and and uh, and that was like one of my mo favorite moments in the movie, and uh, with uh, with the fight scene with James, that was kind of cool. And then when he came in ready to do it, and I made him do it a thousand times over and over again, the different takes, different shots. And so James was awesome, you know, a lifesaver on that. And that totally made the night go by faster. It was good, and, and it, was, it was fun working with him. Now, Gus Larson, like I was saying, um, I met him also by um, you know MCAT and um, through MCAT and um, he also likes to work on movies and stuff and he's been working on a few of his own projects and so anyways uh, I asked him to come on board and I made this character for him and and I, I said you know okay here's your character let's like let's you know you can make it your own, do whatever, and he totally took it. Crane's used to seeing it, doesn't really affect him, and nor the other detective, and we continue seeing. An accident, detective? Yeah, an accident. He totally took the character, he did a great job in um, being that detective Crane, and um, oh, it was awesome, especially him and uh, Jack Kohlberg, who both, they both pair up, Jack Kohlberg, who plays Detective Malloy, um, and uh, so these guys just together, they were awesome. I mean, especially that scene when we first see him in, and uh, oh, it was just great. I had people saying, oh, that, that was a great scene. And then um, of course people just loved it. And even thought, I have had people saying, oh, that guy's you know, good, you know, and uh, uh, he's really good. At, uh, boy, he's believable uh, to, about Gus and Jack. Matt and everybody, even though you know we're just you know amateurs, you know, and this kind of stuff. Um, you know, we have day jobs besides this. You killed my friend. And then um, again, well, Jack Colbert also was in Catastrophic Dana Ma. Um, so I got to know him through MCAT and stuff, and, and he did a great job in Catastrophic Dana Ma, 
and he then again did it again in uh, uh, GR and he took that character and it was all it was awesome we did I remember we just did a few rehearsals and also bam he had it and um, it was just from there on it was magic we really should have got one of these these are delicious it's disgusting no what's disgusting is when you offer people chewing gum after you put your mouth on it this is delicious then there's a uh, Joel Baird okay general manager of Missoula Community Access Television television he was in um, uh, catastrophic denouement. Then Joel got really busy, as it, all managers do. He got totally tremendously busy. So I had to continue shooting without him, knowing that, oh man, I gotta get him in here somehow. Well, we get everybody else done. We get all the shots done. And Joel, after all his busyness, one late night, even after he had like a kind of like it was after work, we shot the whole movie, and then we inserted Joel into it. So that, that's what's so rad, um, and Joel did a great job. I mean, you wouldn't even know that he was not with the actors. I mean, he he like was acting to air, and it was just awesome. He did a great job, and, and you never know. If I didn't say that, you would never know he never acted with, with the, the actors. It looks like he's right there with them. <laughs> this up is to say that um, you can do anything if you put your mind to it and um, you may feel st stupid doing it and you may look stupid doing it but at least you're making something and and, uh, um, and boy it's fun I mean it's, it's pretty cool what you, what you can do with little you can actually do a lot My serum causes rapid regrowth. I'll attempt to make that particular test on myself. And you put this in your body? No more grafting, no more scar tissue. What do we have here? Well, we have a possible drunk driving accident, alcohol residue in the car, flame damage, possible explosion from the gas tank, possibly a set on purpose. Mainridge, someone's trying to kill me. Go on! Save yourself! Nobody move! started with a camera and an idea and the inspiration of too much Peter Jackson old school horror movie and Sam Raimi old school Evil Dead series and uh, a lot of other movies influenced from who knows where and me and my friend got together and uh, said, hey, let's make a zombie movie. So we went in my backyard, I put on some makeup, I said, hey, Nick, you be the hero, I'll be the zombie, because the zombie's fun to play. And then we made the movie, the Zombies. Zombie spoof, uh, the name says it all. Uh, how I got that name is uh, I think me and Hick, we finished, uh, we're coming to finish the movie and, and we were making, because of all the jokes and stuff, I don't know how the name came around, but it was like we're making a spoof and it was a zombie spoof and hey, that's the name, zombie spoof. We'll just name it, zombie spoof, what it is. 
So we named it that, and uh, there was a zombie spear. What the heck happened over there? Man, I don't know. The zombie just like attacked me. It was a zombie. Why I digitally remastered Zombie Spoof was because when I first made the movie, it had copyrighted music in it. So I've been going through a lot of my movies, like uh, Unknown Emissaries and another mo recent movie, I just remastered. I'm not trying to be like those other directors that are making movies, remastering them, um, per se, just because they, they have pet peeves. I'm more doing it so I can share it. Um, without having to worry about anybody getting upset and have copyrighted stuff in it or something like that. Um, that's more why I'm doing it. And another reason why I, I just kind of want to enhance it a little bit. So when you're watching on surround sound or it, when it was when it plays like in a big theater room or big auditorium, um, depending on where it plays or whatever, that'll have this just a big sound and the movie will just seem the size how I envisioned it and uh, um, that's why I digitally remastered the movie and why I'm doing that too a lot of my movies when I started it out I wanted to do all those crazy awesome shots and uh, cool you know POV shots because I like Sam Raimi style. I like Peter Jackson's like crazy, quirky, like cartoony stuff. They're both like Three Stooges, and I like cartoons. So I liked one thing I'd do when I was a kid. I would, when I played with my toy action figures, I would make a lot of my own like, uh, uh, basically like sound effects. And so what I would do is I would, um, like if the guy was shooting, I'd be, <laughs> or he was mad. Ah. Or if it was like a monster, and I do all these sound effects, and it, and even like when talking to friends, I use sound effects. So in my movies, when I was using like the POV shots and the action shots or the crazy, it looks like the video is going to explode shots, I would find myself doing the same sound effects, like like that kind of uh, sounds, and. Uh, and so I wanted a lot of that in the movie. I just wanted to go crazy and have fun with this movie. And uh, so that was kind of the style of the movie. And I wanted to make a zombie movie, but I didn't want to uh, go really dark. I wanted it to be easy, because I didn't know how easy it would be. At first I thought it was just gonna be that first scene that me and my friend Nick Hadley put together. And, um, and uh, I thought that was gonna be it. showed it to friends and then um, we were talking to my art teacher at high school and we showed it to her and she let us show it to the class she approved it and then we showed it to the class the class talked about it and said are you is this gonna be like a big movie and me and you know Nick and um, some of my other friends who wanted to be in it and we're like yeah it's gonna be a big movie so we're gonna make we made this movie um, uh, Big meaning, you know, just a regular length, you know, whatever we could do, like a long feature movie instead of a short. So um, soon, word of mouth spread. Friends saw this scene, and they're like, "Can let's make another? I want to be in this movie. Let's make another scene." So I think of the story, and I thought of the story about radio waves, because so I saw uh, uh, some other movies where they use like gases that make the flesh come to life and they have zombie problems and stuff like that so I thought oh radio waves we'll do like these new type of radio waves and that's what's making the zombies come to life and uh, I thought that's a good that's a good like uh, motivation for the movie and now the problem is the radio waves get turned on now we just need to turn them off because to stop the zombies and it's not going to be that easy of your experiment in URW, Undetectable Radio Waves. Oh, the radio waves! Turn them off! 
then of course with the help of my friends and uh, my brother Chad who uh, plays Hakeem in Zombie Spear, he, they all came up with their own characters. I just said, okay, uh, we just need this guy doing this, okay, do whatever you want. And then Trevor Graciano, he, he also came up with his own character. He wanted to do a little more uh, different style. So everybody did their own thing. I allowed them to do their own thing. So they're all, like, everybody in this movie are all like writers in this movie. They all came up with it. If, um, and we all had ideas and input. And I just, with, with the camera, I was like using the camera as an adjective. Just like enhancing the story, like moving it crazy, doing these crazy shots. Now, a lot of the stuff you see in this movie is everything in this movie is all in camera edited. Meaning, like, when you see a, a shot end, that's because I hit the button. It's not because I edited it in a machine. I didn't have an edit machine. What we did is it was seriously consecutive order, except for that first scene we started out with. I had a I had a limited editing system. I had my camera, a big old honky RCA camera with a videotape in it. And I had a um, karaoke machine for my sound mixer with a TV, just a basic old school 80s old run the mill TV bought second hand. And I would hook up my um, VHS camcorder to the VCR and it would play the raw footage or the scenes or the in-camera edited footage through this karaoke and then to the other VCR to make a master copy. So it was like a, you know, timing game, you know, playing like hitting the record button at the right time, hitting the pause button at the right time. But everything else in the movie it was really cool is after we were done shooting those scenes, the scenes were practically done. They didn't have music in them or anything like that, but they were done. We could play it back and watch and laugh and then go show friends and then get pumped up and go, oh, here's another idea, let's do this. So seriously, it was just shooting on, off, record. Okay, now here, flip, you take the camera and then they film my sequence and it was all in that like order. So um, that's how we made zombie spoof. <laughs> Nick Hadley, he's like the hero of the movie, and uh, Dexter, and uh, he's going to uh, save the day. And we meet him in the movie, kind of midway, like kind of in the beginning of the movie, um, midway through, and he's just uh, doing his regular yard work, and here we have our cool, funny uh, hero. And Nick, he would, he, uh, we're, a lot of the scene you'll see we're, we're shooting in my dad's garage. My dad just let me just destroy it and do whatever movies I film. A lot of movies like uh, my black and white GR and tons of other things in there. And uh, so while we're in the garage and we're filming scenes, there's this piece of wood, like a little stick piece of wood from like a desk that broke off or something like that. And he found that and he ended up using that in the scene. And the stick was Nick's idea. And he just started using it. And then there was a scene, a couple of scenes, that just as it was building up, he started doing this thing where he just screamed like really ridiculously. And that was just funny. It was making us laugh and we were laughing. So we were like, yeah, just let's keep on doing that. So uh, Nick came up with all the stuff you see there with him laughing, screaming, ah, and the stick. And that's all his thing. And, um, and then uh, we did. Uh, um, of course, like a hand scene where he's tacking the hand, and I had to do that from uh, Evil Dead, you know, I love that movie, so we put that in there, and uh, just body parts running around, you know, like The Thing, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, I just like it when the body parts are just like, you, you think you killed one, you killed it, you stopped it, no you didn't, now his legs could come and attack you, now his hand's attacking you, and, and just gets crazier, you know, so. That's what, that's why uh, I thought that was kind of fun. And then I pulled in my brother Chad Ackerman, and uh, he came up and he just made his own character. It's like kind of the village idiot, you know, uh, you know the. The small town guy, I guess. Uh, Hakeem. Nick came up with his name, Hakeem. It was just during 
that one scene, you just yelled it out, and that one scene, that's where the name was, came, it came up, you thought, hey, you know, maybe I'll say Akeem, and me and Chad are like, yeah, that's fine, who cares, we don't care. So, um, I said, Chad, is that fine with you? And he's like, yeah, whatever, I don't care, he thinks it's funny. So he's all, Hakeem, like that, and that's, that's how um, Chad got his uh, character's name, Hakeem, in the movie. This is General D. Uh -huh. I want you to turn the device on. And my dad was in the movie too. He played General D. Duke Shine. He kind of came up with that character um, by himself. He said it reminded him of a character off a television show he used to watch or a movie or something. And he came up with the whole thing of swallowing the cigar and then chewing it up and making it all over his teeth. I think he even got sick when he did this. So yeah, my family, so my brother Chad and my dad were all in it. And so, yeah, it was really fun having them. And, my dad brought a lot to the movie, and it was really fun to have him in it. The radio waves can be counteracted by pressing these buttons. But we must find the correct frequency. Nope. And then we have a man when who plays the scientist, Dr. Frank. And that was his name. He came up with it because his whole joke, he'd always say, Frank, and that was his name. He even, I think, has a, he does music and he made a CD called Frank. And that's just his thing. So he brought that into it. And then he let me dress him up on all this ridiculous stuff. And he even had ideas. He put all this stuff all over his face for some of the scenes. And, and then uh, uh, it was my idea to make this ridiculous gun. I had this like uh, uh, mail opener. Uh, sword and I just duct taped to this gun and I put a flashlight, this old Halloween flashlight and then I had these like kid scissors and I just stuck those to it and so we put that in so we made Dr. Frank a lot of like cool stuff and a lot of the junk around my garage I just grabbed this old tape recorder I got at second hand and I slapped on like a piece of, I think it's a piece of an old VCR and I stuck that on there and it made it look like something in our old remote control but what's what's so so cool is like all that that stuff we added on made him wear that tie and stuff. It was just they um, it was all of us coming out with those ideas. So Matt brought all that comedy, the the, the talking, and I caught your letter and all that stuff. He brought a lot to it and a lot of his comedy. And all these guys like Nick and Matt and all of them, we all were in drama, acting together, uh, doing movies, talking movies, going to the movies. So we all, you know, we were all on that same wavelength, that same vibe. We were all sharing that same wavelength. Uh, so Matt, he was just awesome. Hello. You're late. I had trouble finding the place. I mean, the directions I had weren't, you know, too shocking. Wow. Also had Josh Schumann, a friend of mine from high school, brought uh, some awesomeness to the movie. How's your experiment going? <laughs> and then my friend uh, James Veltri, also in high school, was a character. So I brought everybody into this film. Then there's uh, Trevor, and we pull Trevor on board, and Trevor loves, like, he's the one who introduced me into, like, the Evil Dead, and Peter Jackson's Dead Alive, and um, and some other things, and, and I remember being at his house, Sven and I watching movies, and getting freaked out, and, uh, or just laughing my head off, and stuff like that, with my brother, me and my brother would spend the night there, and stuff, and, and, uh, so Trevor, he came up with all a lot of his stuff, and then uh, we, uh, I wanted to do a really cool scene with him, so um, I knew he was a little more he, uh, patient, and, wanted, and he liked acting, and he liked getting serious sometimes, and uh, um, so it was just me and him one day, and I just took him, we went up above my house where there was this construction going up on the hill, and which was really nice, as you can see all the way out to Carlsbad area. 
um, in California and you can see the ocean in the back and you see this nice beautiful sunset and so um, and then I had Nick Hadley with me and he played the mummy zombie that pops out of nowhere and we just shot the scene and all of us just made it up and Trevor it's all him doing the the slow motion uh, and the screaming uh, and the, the freaking out and um, there's even one point where he's he runs and jumping tripped and he cut his finger open while we're doing the scene and so when he wipes his face you can kind of see it and he's like showing off the blood on his finger and it's some little thick if you know if nobody notices that's there and something he just did and uh, so Trevor was cool and brought a lot of comedy to it especially you get to see of more of his uh, his craziness towards the end of the movie and that's normally how he is he's just like funny uh, guy and has lots of humor and he um, did all that like he even he did because he loved he was like I think he's the first kid on our block that loved Evil Dead so um, like those movies he's, he was a Bruce Campbell fan so he did the whole Sam Raimi's uh, jump up like the possessed like um, when the guys get possessed and they jump up and surprise the audience and the characters in the movie and he'd do that he did that jump just perfectly and that was all him he did that just for that kudos to uh, Sam Raimi's films and stuff like that and so that Trevor was really awesome <laughs> Then we have we had lots of more people. We had uh, uh, Drew Eccles came in, and he's like, I just want to be in the movie too, because he was like in my and he was a classmate, and uh, he's like, yeah, let's, I, I I think this is funny. So he played a zombie, he played a bunch of zombies, especially the zombie with a big fat head. He put on that fat man mask, and he's wearing that. And then he was the kind of the other si the side hero, side plot hero, who comes in and does this backflip and kicks uh, me playing another zombie and he does this whole backflip to kick me and he says I could do backflip so I just made a scene just so I can see him do this backflip in the movie so that's why you'll notice in the movie we did a lot of scenes just to get people involved and stuff and then the other people that came in um, besides um, uh, Drew coming in there, Drew Eccles um, Drew did a lot, he helped out a lot, I think he even sometimes would help with the camera and stuff like that but it was just fun hanging out and we also had um, during his scene when he does that flip, we had Sarah and um, Kelly in the movie, and they came in too because they wanted to be in it. And, um, and, and Kelly was Nick's friend. He called her up, hey, you want to be in the movie? Because I needed her to, like a couple more zombies. I wanted to fill up the movie with more zombies. And um, and then there was uh, Jared, uh, another friend of Nick's and stuff, and I knew him through Nick. And, um, some of my other friends, he came on and just had fun. He had the eye, I added that eye popping out, and he was just, he, he thought it was funny and silly, so he was having a blast doing that. And uh, uh, so Jared was really cool, and we just had Casey, he gets a, I just had him show up so he could be involved, and uh, I made him come in the movie, and I made him get his head knocked off, and I knew he didn't like to wear a lot, he didn't want to put any of the makeup crap on or masks on, so I just made this little, like, um, prosthetic out of paper and crayon and markers. I made mean, it look like his mouth's all ripped off. So he just has something scotch taped to his mouth. And that's it. He let me put that on him. And then um, I just kind of have Nick throw a globe again, just grabbing anything out of the garage. He grabs his globe and throws it at him. And we made it look like his head gets knocked off. So that was Casey in case he let me do that to him. And a lot of the other zombies are just like Matt Unwin or Chad or myself or Nick playing these zombies and then Nick's filming if I'm playing a zombie or Matt Unwin's filming and so we're just you know changing it up and making it happen and so all of us are doing something all of us are just pulling it together to make this movie we're all making it we're all writing it we're all creating it and um, and so that was just uh, those those times during the time when we made this movie in 1999. I was a, I was in high school. It was my senior year, and uh, it was a fun time because it was just getting it was doing what I loved doing, hanging out with my friends, doing movies, making like these fun movies, having a fun time. I loved doing like special effect things. I like making like laughing and doing funny jokes and stuff like that. So it was just really good. So when I look back on it, it also reminds me of 
those nights hanging out with my you know at my dad's house in our garage with our friends and that garage you see in the movie you can see the TV I think that sometimes you see the, the, the football phone and the couch that Nick's, Nick um, gets knocked on by the zombies all that stuff is all that was our hangout that's where we had birthday parties that's where we made movies that's where we watched a lot of the movies that inspired me for me to making movies and this is just something that I like. It, 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 it was the place where we just hung out. It was good times. The, the times when you know there was nothing. You weren't worrying about a lot, whole lot. You were just worrying about getting through school and what you're gonna do after you get out of school. So it was just a it was a good experience and good memories. most memorable experience or memorable part of the movie was I guess that first time when Nick and I started the movie with his scene um, and uh, that was my most memorable part where I, I got to be the zombie pop up out of the ground and we did all those different like shots like random like triple takes and uh, that was just fun and why it was memorable because me and him were just we, we had a blast doing it and uh, and he let me push him around a little bit, and, and uh, we just had fun throwing ideas at each other. And he he was filming. And it was just fun because it was like somebody else who actually uh, it was a, the, that moment. I it was like, oh, here's somebody who gets it, just like how I is thinking on the same wavelength like me. And uh, those were good times. And that was a memorable time. If I made zombie spoof again, what would I do different? I probably what I would love to do different would be to make all the zombies have that same style, not to look exactly like, not like clone them or make copies of them, but make them have that same style, realistic, like a little bit realistic, stylistic kind of look of um, that uh, the zombie I play in that scene with Nick when he's guarding, and I pop up for the first time. And, and then the zombie that Nick plays in Trevor's scene, um, where he pops up out of the dirt there in that scene when it's raining, I would make him more look like that, like scary, and then do all the jokes and then spoof stuff around it, make him look a little more fun. And uh, that's what I would do, would do differently now. So that's uh, the story behind Zombie Spoof, the movie showcase from my old school movie vault. <laughs> Ackerman has been making films since he was in high school and I saw him 
digitally enhancing and re, 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 remastering a lot of movies that he filmed when he was a teenager. And I was impressed with that. And so when, when he asked me if I wanted to be in a movie that he'd written, and he described what it was about, and he told me and what he wanted me to be. He said he wanted me to have my hair hanging down and be a judge. And I said, well, that'd be it. And, and he said, you need to wear glasses. So I had some Buddy Holly reading glasses I put on. And, we put, we, I climbed up a ladder, and <laughs> he made it look real, sur make it, made it, gave it a, made a sense of surreality. And, he, and one, thing, one other thing that was really interesting, he said, now don't worry about the script. Christian Ackerman said, you've read the script, now we're just going to converse the, 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 the general um, <clears throat> intention of the words. And that made it a lot easier. And we had a lot of fun, and, and it was just, it was, uh, it was uh, very interesting to do that. It was fun reading the script, it was fun learning the lines, it was fun. I did a few sh camera sh shots of us doing some scenes, and it was fun getting to play the executioner, which I chose to play as a robot who lived for nothing but death, so I kind of just walked like this and turned like this. And when it came time to pull, the, to, to, to do some work on, 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 <clears throat> on on some very cleverly constructed props salvaged by Christian Ackerman, writer, director, producer, from the storage area of uh, the basic defuncto production equipment that's gathering dust in the nether worlds of the building. <laughs> and, and we put together this nice, very convincing little electrical chair control. And he had built this beautiful electric chair out of some barn wood from Danielle, his fiance's father's farm. And so this, and it was a really nice, surreal little electric chair made out of barnwood. And we used duct tape and electrician Sorry. tape. It's right there. <laughs> I mean, right there. That's, that says it all. <laughs> Catastrophic denouement. <laughs> How about come like stay down here and just go like that? Okay. And, for, and then I'll I'll just I'll do the motion, but you just like move with okay. me. Okay. So well, uh, yeah. What made me come up with this idea, catastrophic data law, I was um, it was weird. I, I remember I don't know what it was. I was like walking. So it's always like me walking somewhere. I always go on hikes or something like that, and that's where I come up with my movie ideas. And I was walking somewhere, and I think it was. I thought that's an interesting thing. I always like deal with that. Everybody deals with that. They're afraid of death. They don't care, or but it's always on your mind. You're always questioning. Someday it's going to happen, you know. And how long can I, am I going to live? And that kind of stuff. So I was playing around with that idea. You, might, you could get me, and but this is where he sits up, and he's going to. Yeah, I got both. Yeah. You got the dome light there. There. Uh, he's pretty black. Okay, good. Sit up. Let me see. Keep your mouth closed. There. Is he in light? Pretty good. Okay, that's okay. Here we go. Go ahead and just spit up in that shirt when I say go. Okay. I'm gonna do. We gotta get out of here. Okay. Ready and go. We gotta get out of here. Come on. We gotta go. Come on. Uh, Mike. Uh. Well, um, Christian, working here at MCAT, I saw some of his movies that he had made before, like uh, uh, Zombie Spoof, and I was really interested in being in one of his films to see how he bring together all these elements of suspense and action and incredibly fragmented filmmaking into a, a complete whole. So when he asked me to be part of the catastrophic team, I kind of leapt at the chance, blindly, wondering how is he going to pull all this stuff together. How's his friend? The Mike Armstrong patient? Not good. What denouement means, it's actually used in the movie industry. It's a French word that we adopted in the English language, which means the answer to a complicated plot um, and twist. It has like a twist, it's like to a plot with a twist. It's the answer to all that confusion or that, um, that when you're going through a movie or through a, a, a certain type, if you look up in the dictionary, it says like a, uh, I think it even uses the word as, um, as a certain um, sequence of an events that happen with a complicated plot and twist, that that is the an it's the answer to all those questions like why everything's happening 
like it is. And that's and then all of a sudden it's like boom, it's like a revelation. You get that, you're like, oh, ding, that's why all this was going on. Kind of like Sixth Sense, like when you you're seeing, you're wondering what's going on, and at the end you find out the guy's a ghost. That's a that's a denouement. And so that's why I thought, oh, catastrophic denouement. That's what it is. It's kind of like Matrix, same thing. In Dana Ma, the guy gets the pill, he wakes up, it's a Dana Ma. And that's the idea. <laughs> okay, I got it. I'll take. That movie was extremely surreal, but it was about one person's quest against the constraints of a very awry judicial system gone completely off the trolley tracks. And it's much more deeper meaning, which I choose not to try to elaborate because I want people to find the conclusion their own selves. What happened to the tree happened for a reason. You just have to be able to accept that. Now, this fate will come to you no matter, no matter who you are, no matter what you are. And you just have to be able to accept that what happened at the tree happened for a reason. For me, I think the, um, the greatest part of the catastrophic denouement was the seeing things in the studio come to life as um, the props that were constructed for the film were used in the film in this super effective way like the electric chair you know just as a prop just looked like a kind of collection of wood or like a child's toy or something and then in the movie it acquires such a um, important significance in the context it's really great to see that ability This is the judge scene, take one, long shot. I won the award for, um, in 2003, I won it for the Hometown Video Festival. It's a national video festival for non-professional original teleplay. I competed nationally with other access centers and other um, people that heard of the festival and competed in it. I'm always, I'm always pushing my limits. I'm like, this one, the challenge was, it was going to be my first, I remember thinking this, I'm making a movie where I'm not taking any, I'm not like taking any other movie soundtracks. So all my other movies, I didn't know how to make music or anything, so I would use other movie soundtracks and uh, to make my movies happen. And this movie, I was like, I'm going to make my own music. I'm going to watch all the copyright things like, um, like, you know, Reebok or any like Nike or anything. I'm going to cover that up. I'm going to use all my original props and keep everything original and make a real movie this time. It's all going to be its own thing. And that was that was the that was catastrophic. That was the leap for me. My new my new leap so I'm using all original stuff. And then now I keep on trying that same thing. Keep on keeping everything original and I've gone on where now I don't do my music. It's like I'll have somebody else step in and compose and stuff like that. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So I keep pushing my limits. I just keep on making more challenges cuz it's not it's not fun to me. It's like it's like boring. It becomes like, why am I still doing this? You know. So if I push my limits, then it's like, oh, it's a little more exciting. So yeah. Okay. And then we'll do it again where it doesn't matter. Where it's... Okay. Here's another. Regret. Why don't you look that way too? Okay. Why you like give a glance like because that other cop and then look back to me and then stop or something? Yeah, like I, like I'm thinking about what you just said. Yeah, what so. he said. Sweet. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna give him character a little bit. Okay. And action. You're a free man, Mr. Hyington. Oh, God. Okay, we just got it. Okay. <laughs> hey, can I call my parents? No. Sorry, guys. Ooh, that was close. Oh, Did we get it? it? No. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what happened? Well, that means I have to go to the parking meter. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's still rolling out. Two.
Haunted Mansion is a movie about a a guy who uh, goes to his uncle's house. Um, to just he's just visiting him, um, and then as he's staying with his uncle, uh, they find out that the house is haunted. But is it really haunted? That's the question. And so um, through uh, through certain events, uh, Mr. Good and Wise um, figures this out and it just kind of unravels. I was asked to make this movie um, I was actually, how this movie came to, about was um, Lori Hudak at, um, here at MCAT asked me to make her a Halloween show and to just fill dead air time um, because she was running a little short on show or had like a, like a 30 minute slot available or something like that. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And, but I was like, hmm, I don't want to just do like some filler kind of show like I've done in the past to just fill airtime on the television. And so uh, so instead I, I set out and I said, okay, I'm going to make this a little a little short. I'll just do it really quick and easy and I'll, I'll get my little stuffed animals and my, my puppets I have and I'll put them together and I'll create a little, really quick little story. Well, it turned out in three days, uh, three long days, um, not just not the whole day this is like after work late at night and sometimes uh, when I get free time during work I'd work on this movie and uh, ended up shooting most of it at my house on blue screen I just put up a curtain blue screen curtain like a basically like a bed sheet up on my wall and just lit it and then I shot all the characters in front of it and then um, and also, I only had one monkey puppet that's uh, also is played by the puppet that's played by is um, is for Mr. Goodenwise and is for Mr. Goodenwise's uncle, Uncle Goodenwise. So there was not two puppets, two monkey puppets. It was one. So that's where the blue screen really helped out. In the end, it totally helped out. And then I was able with the blue screen to really not worry about setting up props. I could do it all within the computer. And then I can also, I did little matte um, shots where I would set, extend certain things. And um, so I wouldn't really have to set up a big uh, set when I wasn't using blue screen. I would just like to add things later in the computer. And that made it really fast and efficient. And this movie kind of proved to myself that I can do this kind of stuff with blue screen. Because I was, at, in the meantime, figuring out how I was going to do things for Virtual 3000. Um, especially after I shot a lot of the effects, I knew I could do it, but I didn't know how well or kind of what direction I was going to go. So, Midnight Mansion was kind of a um, a, a test movie for myself, to um, so I can you know further myself with my other movie, Virtual Three Thousand. So, um, Midnight Mansion was a big stepping stone for me. Oh, that's great! That's great! That's great! Boy, the weather outside is really, 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 really rainy. Um, well, Midnight Mansion, it, I, uh, everybody told after I showed it, and I, I wasn't too happy with it. I mean, I thought I could do a lot better because I only shot it in three days in front of blue screen. I didn't really get the audio up to par. Um, it just, it's all my voices. It's just me doing the whole movie all by myself. And um, so I, I didn't have a lot of help, so I, it, I didn't think it came out that great as I wanted it to. Everybody, like Lori, especially Lori Hudak, was saying, you should just turn this in to the um, Best of the Northwest and, uh, Video Festival and the um, Hometown National Video Festival. Just see what happens, because she thought it was really good. And a lot of other people thought it was really good. So I said, okay, what the heck. So I entered the movie into the hometown video festival which is a national one and didn't it didn't win at all so I got the letter in the mail saying sorry to inform you you didn't win and then um, the best of Northwest came back and it was a small little envelope and I opened it up and there it was it says we congratulate you on winning um, excellence in video art for the best of Northwest 
uh, video festival of 2005. So there I won that I won an award and I was like, whoa, what the heck? This is awesome. I must be doing something right. So hence there was the uh, my confidence for doing well in this kind of video animation uh, slash um, live action, and which was launched me into my next movie, Virtual 3000. So now I had a little more confidence when I was stepping into my other movie um, with all this new ways of doing blue screen special effects and animation and, and manipulation of you know the footage to make the actors live action look like they're part of this animated world and so that was really fun to me but yeah midnight mansion was a fun movie and uh it was a blast to make and a lot of non-sleeping were involved because I was just, I get gun ho so I put it all together and here came Midnight Mansion and here it was and so uh, and, it, and it turned out to be a really cool movie and we still show it in theaters and stuff and with a movie club um, that we do here every last Thursday of the month um, here at MCAT um, we show it in our festivals whenever, as a filler and so it's this really big filler and we put it in it's like a 15 minute movie and everybody seems to enjoy it especially that scene where the car drives up in front of the mansion and the door opens and all of a sudden instead of it being a person or a cartoon it's this puppet gorilla and i think they get a kick out of that and they're like whoa this is what this movie's gonna be like and then it just takes them on this uh, awesome fun ride and it just entertains everybody every time my little sister my little brothers uh, they love the movie. And my little brothers, uh, last time they were visiting me, visiting me, they were going through some of my stuff. I have this room where it has all my movie props. And they found all the Midnight Mansion puppets and the props. And they were amazed by it. And they were playing with them. And they were like so cool that that was actually the, the little monkey prop that was used in the movie. So it really, I'm, I'm really surprised how that movie touched a lot of people. Um, I guess it's uh, like that saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, a good movie is also in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, there was there was Midnight Mansion for you. Drops of rain. A door to other worlds was created. Wow. So right now, time and space is all mixed up. I'm all right. Dinosaurs.
Virtual 3000 to me is a movie about uh, a boy and his journey with uh, a group of friends he finds along the way. And it's a movie about people coming together and not knowing each other very well and helping each other out for a, a, a just cause or a good reason. Um, just uh, the human element of helping people out and, and uh, making friends and that, that kind of coming together and um, just you know bringing it all together and making it through or taking a journey and um, getting to a point that they need to do to get to, whether it be getting back home or um, you know, dealing with some uh, bad guys. My favorite moments of uh, Virtual 3000 um, is probably just seeing it come all together with everybody, being on the, being with people that um, had the same love or the same passion in doing something. Uh, uh, I just being there and playing pretend, basically, with a bunch of friends. And uh, I was able to pr play pretend, and that was my favorite moments of V3, um, being chased by dinosaurs or being shot at by lasers and pretending to be, you know, in a different world. That was fun. That was really fun. Lost. I thought I'd saying. never see you again. Guys, we better get going. Guys, we better get going. Say it again. Guys, we better get going. Let's go this way. Be safe this way. Thank you. Yeah. That's... We're here on the set of uh, Virtual 3000 behind the scenes here. And behind me we're doing uh, some projection work. We have a, this is actually a projected image here. and. And it's just one image projected on the wall, and we flip our actors around, rotate them, kind of like how we did in the cave scene, but we actually had just like one piece of cave, and we just got them rotating the actors around to make it look like one huge set piece. And uh, so that's what we're doing here tonight, and it's been kind of crazy, but fun, and everybody's been getting along. And uh, we also had some, we had a fight with uh, Dave Mobley over there. Look, watch. Say, wait. Oh, yeah. so, hey, my name is Dave Mobley. <laughs> and yeah, he did the fight. He choreographed a lot of the fight scenes you're going to see here uh, um, in this behind the scenes. He's amazing. So when you thrust, I'm going to come here and kick you right in the groin, getting you to lower your shield, and smash oh. you in the face. Okay, that was and then cool. Either and kick back. him. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. 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 Okay. Well, on a personal level, my motivation for making any movie or doing any of this and doing it not getting paid is the love of creating something from nothing. And almost like what the movie's about, a journey, mm -hmm. is the same thing. When you make a movie, it's a journey. And it's an experience that I've never, like every time I made a movie with people, I've never trade um, for anything. It's, um, that's the motivation, is making something that's an idea, putting it on paper, putting it to storyboard, conceptual art, um, and then actually going out on the field or in the studio and making something happen. And then those people that come into it, the people that uh, come to volunteer, literally come and volunteer, not being paid at all, just been given free pizza or some sour coffee, you know, seeing those people come and want to do something as well, that's my motivation and that's making fine. something happen. Is my thing falling off? It like no, he didn't cut you there yet. What? <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't resist a bad joke. It feels like a Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, game positions here. One of my favorite moments is when we first started it and I fall through the ceiling <laughs> as this English night. One of my favorite moments is, I guess, was playing Grant the Evil Cowboy and getting the chance to, uh, and, 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 I, and actually, what was really nice was my, having my son work with him and watching 
watching him do a take, and I was impressed with with the 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 the, the professionalism. What can I say? And uh, I, uh, as far as the acting scene, I think my favorite acting scene was the 1895 Grant the Eagle Cowboy. Okay, well, everybody likes to play a villain. Yeah. You know. It's over when it's over. Draw. That's the way you want it. Yeah, I, I also uh, helped Christian out with some of the, the props. Uh, uh, a lot of the Western stuff, uh, the clothing and the guns and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I do that as a I reenact um, anyway, and so I had a lot of that. Matter of fact, I think a lot of the Western scenes, um, I suggested to Christian, since I had them, let's put a Western scene in. And uh, uh, so that got put in uh, because we had it. it you, these type movies, you use you use what you got, and, uh, and and so we put that in there, and and uh, uh, a little bit of the uh, props for the medieval scene yeah. as well. I think one of the favorite moments. Uh, there's actually many, but I think part part of the the, the fun of it was uh, a lot of this movie was done. Uh, on an empty set in front of green screen and it was a, a challenge to act to nothing or to act to a microphone stand or something like that uh, and pretend it was a real person or, or an android or, or whatever and then to to see it uh, when it was finished to see what what we're reacting to uh, there are parts in this where uh, I actually honestly don't remember when we were acting on a practical set. Uh, there were a few of them, but a lot of them, again, was virtual. And I, 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 uh, I have a hard time remembering what, what we shot for real and what was all added in later. Okay, good. Now look back look now. Cowboy, look back at Trump. Now look back. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably behind the scenes, I would say. All the fun and goofy, stupid stuff we did behind the scenes while waiting for takes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just goofing off and having fun and being something that we're not normally. All the pizza parties. Yes. The yes. gas buildups. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How'd you get past the guard? Sarah! How'd you get past the guard? It's a long story! It's a long story, but it brought me friend Charles. Okay, Scott! <laughs> Virtual 3000 is a sci-fi action comedy spoof on um, kind of Back to the Future meets um, The Wizard of Oz. Um, I probably would say that it was an independent film done by friends, just sci-fi, good fun, you know, good humor, yeah definitely different from the norm, so. Yeah. I don't know, I mean for me like the, the, the greatest moment of the film is really just seeing how Christian brings it together because it is just such a wild ride of pieces and so you never really know like okay you do this you stand here no no this thing's coming at you and you can't really remember even all the stuff and you wonder how it's going to make cinematic sense, and it always does brilliantly. So it's a kind of a great moment when you get that aha, when you see a mastermind is just giving you little tidbits of a maze, so you're just like a rat <laughs> sniffing around a corner, and then when you see the whole maze, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Hey, leave her alone. What a peculiar being. <laughs> So yeah, the best times that I had on Virtual 3000 was the first time that Christian came over to me and said, Hey, I would like you to do this voiceover. I said, well, for what character? And he, then he showed me this really cool effect where uh, the character Makora comes into being at the beginning of the movie, or thereabouts. And uh, my second favorite time was just being actually in the studio and doing the voiceover and just hanging out with friends. It was great. I 
I would say to those people that are influenced, you know, by Hollywood or they want to make a movie and they don't have the necessary funds to make a movie they want and and maybe they're sitting around waiting for to get like a chunk of money to make their dream movie. They have this idea and they think it's great. Um, I say to those people, go out and do it. You have a camera. Technology is so much easier now to, you can, with a few, couple hundred or even a, a thousand dollars, um, over three easy payments and it's yours. You can have your own little editing studio and there's access, television access centers out there like MCAT and uh, that are out there across the United States. It, you should go find out more info about them and um, get involved and you can make your movie. If you don't have the money, there is ways to get around and doing it. And so go out there and just do it because if you don't, when that time comes to make your movie or if it, if it ever does, if you ever get that chunk of change to make your movie and you've, and you've gone on and you've done it and you've done it with nothing and you just went out there and did it, you will know what you can do and how far you can stretch that money and you'll know what you can do with it and um, you'll know all your options, you, you will know, you'll have more faith in yourself and uh, because you've accomplished things with nothing and that's, that's what I got to say to those people waiting or wanting to make a movie. People should come and see Virtual 3000 because it's done locally. It's a homemade movie. It would be a great time to see the movie. Just a good time to be with family and friends and see something you wouldn't get to see anywhere else. Independent, raw, guerrilla filmmaking movie. No budget. It's got a lot of heart and soul into it. It's uh, been it's a labor of love by a lot of people, but mainly Christian. It is made with love, it is made with the sweat and tears and the hands of the people you see in this movie. It's a lot of fun. Kids can come. I think people should really try to get to the premiere because that is when the movie is going to be at its freshest excitement. It is a movie that is when you take spray paint and duct tape, cardboard and non-professional computer animation and you put it all together that's what this movie is. And there's going to be a lot of people in the audience in the early days of screening the film that had a part in the film so that they're going to be a committed um, really reactive audience. It would be a great time to see the movie. They should come to support local filmmakers. We just had such a wonderful time with it. It's a family film uh, and people will just have a good time seeing this and it's a, and it's promoting local filmmaking which is which is always important laugh joke around this guy here says that you should see the movie <laughs> well after i beat him up see virtual 3000 you should come December 1st at mcat 500 north higgins for more information call 
370-1433. That's, that's Virtual 3000's own movie info.